My name is Ryan Davis, uh, here with Witten Advisors. My day job is an economist, but specifically focused on apartments and kind of what we do is we try and make sense of all of the economic data and the supply of multifamily coming online and advise our clients on kind of what that means going forward across markets on a on a national basis so we cover 43 major markets around the country we do not cover memphis i know that was mentioned uh, just a second ago because <laughs> the institutional capital is not that interested in memphis uh, so kind of yeah but we cover you know seattle to southern california to up to boston you know southeast gets all all the the major major markets across uh, the the country and so um, kind of what, what's imp maybe important for this group initially is that we have a company policy of we do not invest directly in apartments. So we get uh, requests from our developer clients to you know, make equity commitments and we just say no, we want to be completely third party. Uh, just provide, as uh, Buck said, fact-based research from an independent point of view. And so our clients are nationwide uh, apartment developers such as Mill Creek Residential, Trammell Crow uh, Residential, there's private equity groups like Carlisle Group, uh, Rockwood, etc. Public REITs are our clients such as uh, Camden and Preferred Apartment uh, Communities. And so we just have a, a broad base of clients that we continually uh, advise on a daily basis. And so what I'm here uh, today to, to do is if I kind of, you know, if I have to miss college football, uh, I'd rather be, you know, talking about multifamily, which is my, my passion. So excited to, to be here. And I think we'll have, you know, Q&A at the end. So I'll just, you know, go through and kind of tell you the investment narrative as we see it uh, for multifamily markets across the, the nation. And I'll start with just the number one question that are it's on our clients mind and that is you know is what's the probability of a recession you know that's dominates the headlines you know you can't go you know can't turn on the tv without seeing you know is there a recession yield curve inversion you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and you know obviously the the fed's goal is a soft landing and while that's a, a noble goal for sure it does not have the best track record um, and you know, as I think Ben Bernanke said it best earlier this year when he said that economic expansions don't die of old age, they get murdered. And that's because they get murdered by the Fed, raising rates uh, too, too fast, uh, too quickly, too high. And so the big concern coming into this year after four interest rate rises you know, last year is, you know, is did the Fed overdo it again? And kind of coming into this year is big kind of uh, capital market gyrations and the Fed to get all the credit in the world um, pivoted away from that and so now we've seen two um, you know de decreases so far uh, this year so that it's positive that they are showing some signs of being able to um, kind of adjust with the, 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 the markets and so if we had to boil it down to kind of one indicator that we would be tracking to see if the recession is around the corner, that would be the spread between the 10-year treasury and the two-year treasury, which is still positive. And so kind of the, the, the theory is that if short-term rates are higher than longer-term rates, then the economic growth outlook is not favorable. And in the short term, the Fed would have to cut those short term rates. And so you are seeing uh, yield curve inversions across different maturities. So three months, six months, one year that the, those short term rates are higher than the 10 year uh, treasury. But the, the one we think that has the biggest explanatory power is a spread between the 10 year and the two year, which is still positive. That is, it has not inverted. And so uh, the, you know, the headlines love to focus on the negative aspects uh, you know, of it because negative news sells, right? So, but we like to you know, focus on this one. You can see it has a, a very good track record. One really only false positive in kind of the you know, 98 uh, period where it in inverted for a little bit then went back to the, the positive. But you can see it's, it's inverted prior to you know, every, re every recession. And so um, it, we, it still hasn't inverted. And so we don't think that 
a recession is imminent, you know, at, at all. Um, and even if it did, and so, uh, you know, the, the headline says yield conversion in September, it's not going to, it still may remain positive. It did invert for about a week or so uh, in the, uh, earlier, but it's now back to the positive and look at it, you don't want to, you'll go crazy if you look at it on a daily basis. And so don't focus on that. We take a, we'd like to look at the monthly average, which smooths out a lot of those daily you know, gyrations. And so it's still positive, but even if it did invert next month, then we wouldn't see job losses until the early 2021 uh, period. So you still have some time, but um, so we, this is kind of our favorite uh, indicator to look at. Now, what has gotten me a little concerned, and this is just in the past two weeks, has anyone uh, been reading the headlines of SOFR, kind of the, the dislocation of the re, uh, repo markets recently? Yeah, so that reminds me a lot of 2008, right? And so that's kind of, if, you're looking at elements of risk to focus on, that may be something that's, that's out there. Because you, you look at that and you read these headlines and you're just like, oh man, you know, markets aren't functioning correctly. And in the financial markets, and that's, you know, as we saw in the last recession, has, can have huge ripple effects throughout the you know, overall uh, economy. And so, yeah, there's debate on, you know, maybe it's just you know, due to regulation and you know, corporate tax payments, et cetera, that was causing that dislocation. In the, uh, it's called SOFR, uh, the Secured Overnight Financing Rate, which is going to replace LIBOR in, over the next uh, couple of years. And so if that's not functioning and you have a mortgage that's resets, then that could be bad. Um, so I think there's, I think it will get work out. I think the, the Fed will kind of change some of their you know, regulation, I, but I think it is something to you know, think about and uh, you know, potential you know, ramifications um, you know, of that. But kind of the, the short term uh, you know, story is that we do not see any recession uh, lurking around the corner. However, economic growth is slowing. And that's, that's for sure. We had a, a short-term bump after the tax code overhaul at the end of 2017, which uh, made you know, uh, businesses more profitable, increased ta after-tax take-home pay. And so we saw job gains here kind of re-accelerate, right, from after 2017 to 2018. And now they've uh, re resumed their slowing uh, pattern as, as well. And going forward, we, we expect job growth to dip below the 2 million run rate. We've been, we added about two and a half uh, last year and it's been slowing. And so it dips below 2 million this year. And then out in 2021 and 2022, dipping to about 800,000 jobs added year over year. And so job growth is slowing, that's for sure, but it's not due to some underlying economic problem, right? The, really, the issue is that we're running out of workers. I mean, with the unemployment rate so low, immigration policy isn't letting you know in the you know, people you know, into the country that we that we need that could fill uh, these jobs. And so it's just we don't have enough workers to fill the positions. I mean, companies could hire if they they uh, could, but they just can't find the, the number of workers. And so job growth uh, is slowing, but again, it's not something that you should be uh, concerned about. And more importantly, we'll see later that it definitely varies a lot across uh, markets uh, as well. And this next slide, I think speaks to kind of the, 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 the biggest, uh, probably the most overlooked aspect of the economy right now. And that's just the, the demographic story. And that is that if you looked at the percentage of all adult population that is, that's employed, so 63% were employed back before the financial crisis. And then you look right now, 61% of the adult population is currently employed. And you would say, okay, well, maybe we have some room to go, right? I mean, we aren't back to that level. But if you break that out into age groups, and compare the employed rate compared to where we were prior to the recession, we're seeing we're back almost you know, equal to where we were, in some cases above those levels. And so we're back to you know, full employment. The problem is, is that the older age group, it's a huge, you know, it's the baby boomers. That's what's happening. And so that's weighing on the aggregate 
numbers. It's weighing on those aggregate job growth numbers that we saw on the prior slide. It weighs down wage growth. I mean, everyone probably has heard, you know, wage growth has been stuck at two and a half. We've gotten, you know, a little bit of bump, you know, 3%, you know, recently. That's all due to just if you take the average and you have baby boomers, which typically are higher, pay, higher paid employees that are exiting the workforce, then are just being offset by uh, 20 to 34 year olds that are beginning their careers and take a job with a lower salary. That just brings the average down. And so really that's looking, that's the, if you look at those aggregate average you know, wage growth numbers, that's distorting the, the picture. And so if you dive into those and look at wage growth uh, in the you know, younger age cohort, the you know, 35 to 44 et cetera, you can see 4% plus wage growth, 5% in some cases, and probably the best um, news most re recently is that the lower income employees are seeing the biggest gains in wage growth. You know, call it you know, 6%, 7% in some cases. And so there's lots of good news that's uh, associated with the economy, that it, but you have to get below those headline numbers. And so that's, that's kind of you know, our you know, big kind of picture takeaway uh, on the uh, economy. And so let's get it back to multifamily, right? So the economy is the foundation for the apartment markets because more jobs equals more paychecks and many of whom will rent apartments or they have the option of going out and renting single family or buying a home, et cetera. And so I'll get to those uh, you know, aspects a little bit later on, but the economy is the, the foundation. But why would you want to invest now? Let's say you had a, a late cycle approach. You think that we're later you know, in the cycle, that there's a recession coming on. Why would you want to invest now? Well, apartments, have outperformed all other commercial real estate types, call it office, retail, which is a, a dirty word uh, right, right now, uh, office, uh, hotels, et cetera. They tend to outperform in the last three of the four uh, last you know, recessions, they've outperformed other commercial real estate property types. And so this is data from NACREF, which is kind of the institutional standard for apartment returns. And then, more importantly, during that early recovery period, because of the short-term nature of apartment leases, you can really jack up the rents pretty, pretty quickly. And so apartments really outshine during the first years of an economic uh, recovery. And so that's uh, you know, part of the reason why we're seeing a lot of investment in uh, you know, multifamily is because apartments are recession uh, re resilient. But more importantly, kind of looking, you know, not just at the apart, uh, apartment performance during recessions in the early part of the recovery, kind of taking a broader picture, going back to the late 90s, we can see here's just the average return for all property types, excluding multifamily, which is about 8%. But then you look at the volatility of returns, office and retail and hotels, you know, much more you know, volatile than apartments overall. And so kind of if uh, anyone's familiar with the sharp ratio, which is a measure of just a risk adjusted uh, return, if you compare that to apartments, really apartments have you know, outshone all the other types of commercial real estate now for, I mean, a, a while. And so apartments have generated a little over 9% and then are uh, much less volatile a, as well. And so that's part of the reason why, you know, we're still bullish on, you know, multifamily. And then in addition, we'll see in just a little bit, they were underhoused as a, a nation. So even if we were to go into a recession this time, we aren't over our skis. I mean, that's what's got us into problems before is that we've been oversupplied in terms of housing. And so we aren't in that situation right now, which would lift apartment performance, even if we experienced a recession. But looking at kind of the, the fundamentals of multifamily. So the line right here is what's multifamily jargon uh, is absorption. It's basically the number of net leases signed over the past year on its annual rate or the net number of move-ins, you know, et cetera. And so that's been, you see that we had a big spike in 2010 and then it uh, eased. And then we had been running at about 200,000 apartments lease since the early part of 2015 into 2018. And then it spiked uh, last year to 250,000 uh, units uh, leased on an uh, annual rate. And we've been there now for the past you know, four quarters. More importantly is that that demand number is exceeding the supply. 
And so that's the, the supply is this light pinkish uh, color here, which has been running about a little over 200,000 units. And so we've had excess demand of 50,000 units over the past year. So more apartments leased that have come online. Now you may see some of the headlines that say the uh, com total completions are 325,000 units. Well, you have to take out the number of units that we scrape each year, demolition, uh, converted to other uses, you know, con condemned, yeah, et cetera. And that's, that's a lot of units. That's 100,000 units that are wiped away from the apartment stock each year. And so the, really the relevant statistic is looking at the net supply, and that's what we do here. And so if you add on 100,000 units, you, we're delivering about 300,000 units on an uh, annual rate. Uh, over the past uh, you know, 12, 12 months or so. But the most important aspect is that demand has been outstripping uh, su supply. And if we had to boil the health of the apartment markets down to one statistic, it would be rent growth. And that is the year over year change in effective street level rents. And that is just an indication of pricing power, what kind of pricing power do owners have? Are they able to bump up uh, rents as they have? And you can see that we've gotten the third tailwind beginning last year. And so we had a, a pop during the early part of the recovery, began to decelerate, then another pickup to over 5% in the 2014, uh, 2015 range. That was due to uh, the higher economic growth in addition to, uh, is anyone familiar with revenue management systems? Yep. So all of that technology that the airlines had implemented on the optimal pricing of tickets, that began to be adopted by multifamily. I mean, us as a real estate industry, we're uh, loath to adopt new technology. We're kind of dinosaurs in a way. But um, that began to really impact uh, you know, pricing power, all of that technology hitting. And so we saw another uh, wave. Then it had begun to slow again. But then with the pickup in job growth in 2018, we saw apartment demand pick up as well. And then uh, rent growth has uh, re-accelerated recently as well. So we're running right now at about a 3.5% uh, rent growth rate which is about 50 basis points higher than the long-term average. Long-term, uh, what's normal across the U.S. is pushing rents by 3%, and right now we're above that 3.5%. And many local markets are far above that, and some are far below, uh, but we'll see that in, in just a, a second. So just continued health, healthy, healthy fundamentals from a macro standpoint. Now. And some of you might say, oh, I'm, I'm experiencing some weakness in you know, this property. Where we see weakness right now is pockets where supply has been concentrated. So if you have uh, parts of Seattle that have four deals in lease up that are on the four corners of a typically a, a same intersection, right? There's been heavy pockets of heavy supply concentration. Now those properties, and if you compete with that supply, then you'll be seeing below normal uh, rent growth rates and concessions, et cetera, but uh, just overall very healthy performance for uh, multifamily across the, the nation. So healthy renter demand. There's also uh, lots of investment demand. And so this is uh, uh, transactions. So how many apartments traded hands in terms of the dollar amount? And it's reached an all-time record high of over $180 billion traded hands over the past year, which is I mean, that's uh, enormous. And th those, those kind of aggregate totals, though, can be skewed by entity and portfolio transactions. You know, call it private equity groups, you know, exiting out because their you know, fund is coming to an end, you know, et cetera. And so we like to look at kind of the, the individual asset sales, which is, uh, we think, the, the best barometer for overall capital market health. And that's in the green. Uh, bars and that in increased to over 140 billion dollars, and so that's also an all-time record. And so investors are pouring money into U.S. multifamily, and that's partly because the apartment story and those the, the, those data points that I showed you earlier about uh, multifamily outperforming uh, most other commercial real estate types uh, it, you know, overall, and just and also during recessions that's now spread to the entire globe. 
And so the number of international clients that we've added over the past four years, I mean, it's companies from Australia, you know, pension funds, the Middle East, sovereign wealth funds, you know, et cetera. And so that, that story, everyone wants to be in, in multifamily, especially when you look at negative bond yields in parts of Europe and Japan, and you look at the risk adjusted returns, I mean, it's, it's almost a, a no brainer for uh, the you know, in investors. And so that's part of the reason why there's so much uh, money pouring into to multifamily. And that's despite the fact that cap rates are at all time lows. So you're going in return overall nationally 4.9%. So sub 5% you know, levels, that's what you would expect. Just going in, you know, no, nothing changes, which that's not realistic, but going in returns, cap rates 4.9% been there for the past you know, three quarters, not continuing to decline as we had seen since the early part of the, this cycle, but generally you know, holding steady. And, uh, but they're still at you know, all time lows. And they're holding steady despite the fact that we saw a run up in 10 year treasuries. It's kind of hard to remember that over the, you know, since the later part of 2016, you know, right before the you know, election and right after, we've seen a, a bump up in interest rates. And then in 17 and 18, treasuries had been increasing. And then capital market dislocation early part of, of this year, they've since come way, way back down. But treasuries were rising at the same time, cap, cap rates were declining. And so it's just, it's a tug, tug of war between kind of what you know, return you can get on an investment versus the m amount of capital that has to get placed. And the amount of capital out there right now that's chasing multifamily, I mean, it's a, a wall of capital that wants to get placed in multifamily, either in through you know, development or through really now the story is value add uh, deals because the returns on value add properties, I mean, those, some of those funds have outperformed development over the past three years, which is just, I mean, that's unheard of because really the, the majority of the risk is on the new construction side, right? But just the value add story has been tremendous. And we, now we don't expect that the value add funds to continue to outperform you know, development, but they're going to still do you know, uh, pretty, pretty well. So kind of the, the, the point of this chart is that even if you see treasuries rise in the short term, that doesn't necessarily mean cap rates uh, are, are going to rise. And just the, with the amount of money that's wanting to get placed in multifamily, we don't think you know, uh, cap rates will rise you know, anytime soon, especially now um, just with the just alternative investments across the nation. What they are correlated to is buyer IRR targets. And so this is a survey that the Real Estate Research Corporation has done going back since the late 80s. So it's a tremendous asset and it has a much higher correlation to cap rates. And that basically that's you know, a survey of investors. Okay, what kind of you know, internal rate of return do I expect to get? And so you can see that there was a kind of a reset after the election. Everyone's trying to figure out, okay, are we in this higher growth investment and uh, environment? And, but no, we're not. And so kind of has been uh, trending down. Recently uh, ticked back up in the second uh, quarter. And so that could put a little bit upward pressure on apartment cap rates, but probably has more to do with the regulation. Uh, and so, so from the yeah, uh, uh, investors that were surveyed, invest in California, uh, you know, Oregon, you know, New York. And so they're saying, okay, if I'm going to invest in those locations, I, and there's the ones that have just passed statewide rent control uh, measures. And so they need a, a higher rate of return to compensate for that, that risk. But just, um, just a solid, you know, again, fundamentals from both the demand supply side in terms of supply and demand for renter, but then also in terms of the investment markets, just lots of demand for uh, multifamily. And now, kind of scope out a bit and talk about the housing market in general. And home prices had been rising about 7% each year. And then we had got to the point where, you know, after lots of uh, Federal Reserve interest rate increases, that began to crimp home price appreciation. Still, I mean, we're running about 3% uh, over the past year. So solid growth, not just not the 5% plus levels that we had become accustomed to. But more importantly, recently, with the decreasing 
mortgage rates over the past year. Now home P and I's are have declined, and so what's the, this is just looks at the uh, median uh, the change in a, the median price principal and principal and interest payment on a uh, single family home, and so that has declined, and so. We do expect home affordability, which has been just ownership has been relatively more affordable than to what it has been in the past in terms of how much does a P and I payment, uh, you know, what is that share of income? Um, and so we, it has been more affordable. Renting you know, has not, but this decline in mortgage rates uh, will continue to uh, you know, allow ownership to maybe at the margin uh, you know, make more sense for a household in turn compared to renting uh, an apartment but again it's not some kind of sea change right and so we do expect the home ownership rate to kind of flat maybe inch up over the next year but we've been that's the a continuation of the trend that we've seen since 2016 and so the you know the home ownership rate the overall went from 63% in the mid 90s to 69% at the peak of the housing boom in 2004. Now it's back to 63%. You know, that's a, just a huge story. But now it's been rising uh, over the past, you know, call it three years or, or so. And then if you break it out into the home ownership rate for millennials, as millennials age, they get married and have kids and need more space than the typical apartment provides. And so we are seeing that those home ownership rates trend higher. But again, kind of looking at the apartment demand picture that we saw several slides ago, apartment demand has still been solid. And so even with a rising home ownership rate, apartments can still do very well. I mean, we experienced that uh, in the, the mid uh, 2000s. But look, more importantly, kind of what's behind the rising home ownership rate recently, it's not this mass exodus from yeah, apartments that are now owning single family homes. And you can look at, you know, the, the public REITs all published statistics on that. You know, they've surveyed their residents or they're moving out for, to buy a new home. Those remain very, very low. How it's all due to single family renters that are now becoming owners, right? So during the housing boom, there were a lot of households and families that ended up owning homes that shouldn't have. And so, but still they have you know, kids and they need space. And so when they had to give their keys back, they ended up renting a single family. They aren't, they aren't gonna move into apartments. They ended up renting single family. And so you can see here, we went from a nation of growth in households, of owner households to renting, and now we're becoming more owners again. But that is all due to single family renters now going to ownership. If you look at the demographics, so apartment renters are younger, they're not married, they don't have kids. If you look at the demographics of single family owners versus single family renters, it's the same. They're, they're married, they have kids, and so it's very much a life cycle, life uh, stage decision whether or not to you know, rent an apartment or you know, live in a single family uh, a home, be it for sale or, or rent a product. Now, in terms of overall housing supply and demand, that as a, in general, we haven't been building enough. And so how, total household growth shown here in the, the green has been outstripping uh, overall supply. So we're just now getting back to the 1.2 million units delivered. And so this is all types of housing, for sale, rental, single family, multifamily, et cetera. We're just now getting to the long-term historical average of 1.2%. Now we were, you know, very much oversupplied uh, back in the, the late 2000s, but we've since worked that off. Um, and now we're in a situation that demand is outstripping supply. And so that has led to a shortage of, by our estimates, of a little bit over 1.2 million units than what's normal at this stage of the, the cycle. And that's across kind of, we break it out between single family, multifamily, for sale, rental, and it's across all uh, product types. And it had been, you know, less than a little bit in the first quarter of this year, but then uh, gapped back out again uh, in the middle part of, of this year. And so a deep housing shortage and kind of mentioned overall that even if we were to go into a recession in the overall economy, 
that this is what would lend support to housing just overall and then specifically for uh, multifamily uh, as well. Now we have a deep shortage and that includes you know, multifamily and you would think that you know, developers are doing their best to try and resolve that because developers, especially apartment developers, they, they're in the business of building, right? That's what they are good at. They will build, they will overbuild if uh, you, you let them, um, but they are trying their darndest. And so you can see uh, juxtaposed to that prior slide where we saw the slow ramp up in total supply that's been weighed down by slow single family production, multifamily, is more of a V-shaped recovery this cycle, ramped up considerably from the 100,000 yeah, unit range. Now we're been about 325,000 units in holding uh, at, at that level. We don't think supply will continue to escalate. And that's due to land prices. I mean, just land is ridiculously uh, expensive. And then in addition to just construction costs and not only in the material side, which have been impacted by tariffs, um, but also mainly on the labor side. Construction labor, there's a shortage of construction workers out there. I mean, there, we uh, hear stories from our clients all the time of people showing up and saying, oh, we'll offer you five more dollars an hour, and a whole sub crew walks off their site and goes down to a project you know, across the way. And so that, I mean, that's, what, what can you do, right? And so that's leading to uh, delays in, in projects. And so that's just, when you talk about the interest cost on construction loans, that just adds and just makes fewer and fewer deals pencil from a development you know, point, point of view. And so that's why we've seen supply kind of you know, stabilize you know, right now. In addition to NIMBYism, you know, kind of right now, you can only really build to in the kind of urban core central cities. They've welcomed new development. But as you get further out into the suburbs, they fight tooth and nail for that construction project because they do not want multifamily in their, their backyard. And so you add that onto the prices, it's just that's why we're seeing multifamily uh, construction levels plateau at about the 325000 a range and there's our estimate for for this year and so kind of going forward we've you know, had this you know good run right i mean it's been a great run really this is the golden age of multifamily right now i mean so many millionaires have been created billionaires have been created in just multifamily and i know kind of the you know we works and facebook's and the internet companies get a lot of the headlines but there's been so much wealth created in multifamily that don't get the headlines. It's just fantastic. I mean, I love the stories of, you know, one of our clients is a guy that didn't go to college that started rehabbing multifamily when he was 20 years old and is now, you know, owns over a billion dollars in multifamily you know, assets. And so it's just those stories, there's been just tremendous wealth uh, created. Do we expect that going, going forward? And our answer to that question is, Yes, and this is the reason. Does anyone know? Yes, that's right, it's uh, Petra. And so this was a, a, a source of ancient prosperity. It was kind of the crossroads between trade routes. And so it's also, this uh, Petra is also the foundation for modern apartment prosperity. And so what this means is we're kind of reaching there with the, the E, yeah, that uh, it's a propensity to rent apartments. And so what that means is that if we look at the share of households that have chosen multifamily, it's been rising now since the late 70s. And so go back to 1979, 9% of households chose to live in apartments. Most recently, it's 12%. And there's been some ups and downs, the housing boom, when you just, you know, didn't even need a pulse to get a mortgage, right? And so it's just kind of, that's uh, ups and downs with that. But the trend is higher right and that's due to we're getting married later in life right so the average age of a woman when she gets married has gone from 22 and 78 to 29 most recently getting or having kids later so the average age of first birth for a, a mom it has gone from 23 to 27 now you could say that you know the average age of first birth is lower than the average age of marriage <laughs> But um, so the, all that uh, 
it just speaks to the fact that now we're going from, the, in terms of young adults married, the percentage of young adults that are married, 60% in the late 70s, and that's been cut in half to 30% right now. In all of those life decisions that are associated with higher home ownership rates, I mean, if you're married and have a kid, your home ownership rate is 80%. But if you're young and don't have a kid and you rent, you rent apartments. I mean, that's what you, what you do. And so those are trends that have been in place for nearly four decades, and they aren't going to change. And so if we break this out further by age, all age groups uh, under the age of 65 are more, high, are more likely to rent apartments than they were nearly 40 years ago. And so those are just trends that have been in place and will continue to propel the you know, multifamily markets going forward. Now, we aren't going to get the you know, 6% rates of rent growth that we had seen earlier in the cycle. Things are slowing along with the economy, but it's still going to be, uh, generate lots of, of wealth uh, going forward. And so our forecast for the nation, before we get into local markets here, is that demand, the economy should continue to, to produce jobs, but it's slowing, right? We're going from 2 million to you know, a little over 2 million to 700,000 by 2022. So we're off by two thirds, but apartment demand you can see is remain steady. And so some of our clients uh, like to talk about the number of jobs, you know, what it, how many jobs does it take for one apartment leased? And I don't know, does anyone like to use that measure or know about it? And it's just kind of a, a you know, if, if an economy is generating jobs, then you, okay, it needs you know, six jobs for each apartment absorbed. Well, that ratio is, is not predictive at all. And especially going forward, when we're going to have slower job growth but steady apartment demand, that ratio is going to be even lower. And so if you use that, then you're going to be misled in, term, in terms of the amount of demand for apartments that is out there. And so 200,000 units added, kind of just stable. That almost fills up the number of net completions out there. So I mentioned that we scrape about 100,000 units uh, each year. And so again, occupancy, it will soften a, a bit. Rent growth will come down. We're not gonna grow at three and a half percent. We're trending more towards what's normal across the nation, which is 3%. And so there's no kind of you know, hard landing out there. What we're doing is we're going from this period of tremendous growth of you know, we've seen rent growth, we've seen occupancy levels sky high, and now we're just getting back to more of what's normal. And so it really depends on your view. Are you a glass half full, you know, or half empty? You could go from, or we're going from 6% rent growth to 3%, it's cut in half. And you know, I can't invest in that or you know, whatever. But no, it's really, we're going from this period of just tremendous performance to really what's average across uh, history. So it, varies considerably across local markets, as you probably all uh, know. So we'll kind of give some high level views on just local markets across the, the country. And so again, we track 43 major markets across the, the nation, and this looks at job growth. And you may read so, you know, the, the numbers in your local business journal or newspaper you know, or what have you, and it says, oh, the Dallas economy added 100,000 jobs over the past year. Well. Those numbers are wrong. They, are, they come out, they're the BLS, I mean, they try their best, but they're a government uh, you know, agency, they have limited resources, and so they only, those numbers that you read are only a survey of about a third of all jobs out there right now. And that's the, but they're timely. I mean, they're great, they're monthly, they're timely, they give you some indication, but they're <laughs> you know, generally uh, right, specifically wrong. And so, um, what we do for our clients is that we get them to what's more an accurate number. And so the BLS also produces some uh, more uh, accurate data. It's more of a census of all the workers. The only problem is it comes out with the lag. And so the, the Federal Reserve uh, banks around the nation, they do them for their uh, districts. And then we provide these estimates across all of the, the markets. And so these are what's kind of really what's uh, accurately happening. And so in Dallas, we didn't add 103,000 jobs, we added 64,000. But for the most part, it goes the, the other way, especially in a uh, you know, metropolitan area like Raleigh. It's not the 2%, it's really 3% uh, numbers. And so you can see that, that job growth for the US of 2 million, a little over 2 million, it's a 1.2% growth rate. 
that's not very high, but you can see that the top performers uh, in terms of the nation far outperform those aggregate numbers. So again, it speaks to the theme that if you just look at the headline numbers, you're going to get a dis very distorted picture of what's happening across local economies. So Austin, San Francisco, Las Vegas, 3.5% or better uh, economies, very uh, high rates of, of growth. And then you can read you know, across there. So many in the, you know, the Phoenixes in the southeastern part of the, the nation, then also in the, the inner west region uh, as, as well. So uh, you know, San Francisco is only coastal California market uh, to, to make this, this list. In terms of absolute numbers, New York is always the top ranked uh, market, but it's, uh, yeah, that's 20 million people. <laughs> In there and so just kind of distorted and so that's why we prefer to look at you know, uh, growth rates and then you know, the, the laggards there which tend to be in the, the mid-Atlantic uh, regions along with some of the, the Florida uh, smaller markets um, as, as well so that's the job growth picture but again these are uh, you know many of these markets are experiencing growth rates that are far above the national levels and then here is maybe my favorite statistic to look at the health of local markets and this is domestic migration. And so net, on a net basis, how many people did a, a local market attract or how many did they lose uh, to other markets across the, the nation? And so you can see kind of what sticks out here is New York City lost 200,000 U.S. citizens to other areas of the country. So that's not to say that some people didn't move into that market, but they lost a lot more people than uh, to, uh, that didn't compensate for those uh, additions. So the, that pattern extends to most other gateway markets. So you can see big losses in Miami, Chicago, uh, Los Angeles, et cetera, D DC. So, but that's really, that's not anything out of the norm. Those uh, markets tend to lose a lot of domestic uh, uh, you know, people. But the clear leaders are Phoenix and Las Vegas, uh, Tampa, Dallas. So those inner west markets can get off the coast of California. Then in addition to Texas and the southeast, those are seeing the biggest gains in terms of domestic uh, migration. They're just magnets for people you know, moving to, to those markets. And more importantly is that if we compare the recent rate in Vegas to what's been normal through most of this recovery, the domestic migration rate is accelerating in Vegas. It's accelerating in Phoenix, also in Riverside as well, while most others are decelerating, even the, the high growth markets of the Southwest East. And so this just speaks to the great affordability migration off the coast of California. And I don't want to beat up if you're from you know, the, the coast of California too, too much, but it is real. And people are moving from those high, high cost of living areas, and they're getting in their car and driving and they're gonna stop in the Inland Empire, Riverside, Santa Bernardino, or go to Vegas or Phoenix. And that's just the propelling demand for housing there, which is supporting apartment markets. I mean, Las Vegas and Phoenix are the two leaders in terms of rent growth, seven and a half percent, eight percent levels yeah, over the past year in Vegas and, and, uh, and Phoenix. Just, I mean, far outperform every other market across the, the nation. In addition, those are, have been later to recover markets and so supply hasn't gotten ramped up uh, in, in those all too much. And so that's uh, supporting continued uh, rates of big rent increases in those markets. Now this looks at international migration. And so you can see that New York City comes out the, the winner here in terms of absolute uh, gains in addition to you know, Miami and LA. And so there's some you know, it, offset to those domestic losses due to immigrants coming in, but still can't offset the, the big losses. Kind of the one big change is Orlando, and that is due to Hurricane Maria. And Puerto Rico actually gets classified in international. And if you look at the, the top percentage of Puerto Ricans uh, residents in terms of local population, Orlando has the highest percentage right after New York City. And so all the, those people are, have gone and moved to Orlando. And so that's uh, why Orlando has been I seen really a solid performance recently. And then in addition, I mean, kind of focused on, you know, kind of demand overall, but this looks at 20 to 34 year old population growth, which is the key demographic for apartments. I mean, you know, you hear a lot of anecdotes about baby boomers downsize and moving in, There's, that's negligible. I mean, that hardly shows up in the, the data right now. So, but really the key demographic is young adults. And so 
The U.S. overall, we're past peak millennial. We grew by about a half a percent uh, last year, but many markets are far above that rate. Two and a half percent in Phoenix, or you know, a little of two percent in Phoenix, uh, you know, leads, leads the nation. And then many markets, including Seattle, but then the inner west, Texas, uh, the southeast, that they're attracting young adults at record clips. And so the, many of those are going to rent apartments. And so just very uh, strong patterns across uh, the, those markets. Now, supply could derail the whole thing, right? And kind of shows you that supply is contained at a national level, about 325,000 units. Now, when we look at that in terms of the starts rate, that's about one and a half percent. But if we look at local markets, many of those are far, far above that. And so yeah, there, there are higher growth markets, but that there are also higher growth in terms of supply. But in kind of one of the themes uh, this cycle is that there's a lot of supply getting built, but it's getting filled up. Now, some of these places like Charlotte, which is seeing a 5% uh, growth rate in, the, in terms of new supply, which is down from the 6% levels that it saw at the same time last year. Now, I mean, that's crazy numbers, right? But that's all getting it's, it will all get leased up. It's just a function of pricing power. And so those units will get filled up, but developers will have to offer concessions. And so that top of the market product is now you know, underperforming because it has to compete with all of the new supply. Because we don't, I mean, there are some LIHTC programs where you build some you know, affordable units, but really it's all market rate at the end of the day because that's where it only makes economic sense. Now, if someone can figure that out, that's the maybe the key to the kingdom of kind of unlocking the affordability uh, puzzle. But really, everything's being built, uh, you know, market rate. And so Charlotte's, uh, Salt Lake, Austin. Austin, in terms of the amount of supply that has come online, is just tremendous. Uh, if we look at the end of 2022 and look at the number of apartments that have been built, it's been over 100,000 units this cycle, which is about a third. So the th a third of Austin's apartment stock will have been built this cycle by the end of 2022. It was the reason why it's, it was one of the first markets to recover. Supply is ramped up there, eight, 10, now 12,000 units added on an annual basis. It's, again, it's getting leased up, but pricing power will be affected. And you can see, kind of going, going across uh, uh, Houston, I don't know if anyone has any investments in Houston, but Houston got hammered uh, after the oil price de decline in 2014, didn't add jobs for 15 and 16, started to add jobs in 17 and 18. But at the, the, and then we had Harvey, which is a, a, a bit of a, a bump up, but so far it's just, it's really struggled. And it's just the amount of supply that was hitting while the economy was tanking that just has weighed on apartment rent growth over the past uh, so, several years. Some improvement, but not all that, all that much. So here's kind of where I'd like to end in terms of kind of how we see markets going forward. And this looks at our forecast for rent growth. And so we take into all of the, these job growth trends and d domestic migration patterns, et cetera, the rent to buy decisions versus how much supply is coming online, you know, all of this. And so here's kind of our kind of takeaway, if you want, um, in terms of markets that should outperform or underperform. And so, We'll start maybe, we'll start in Texas, where this is about average uh, performance for the Texas markets. Fort Worth and Dallas are a little bit you know, above that. Austin's way down just by the amount of supply, and Houston a little bit as well. San Antonio is just the steady eddy of the Texas markets. It's a 2%, 2.5% uh, rent growth uh, market, no real big swings. But looking here, you can see the inner, inner west markets, specifically, uh, yeah, you know, Las Vegas should see some of the highest rates of rent growth, and there, that's the uh, Inland Empire as well. So those markets should see four, four and a half percent uh, rent gains. Southern California is uh, supported by you know, not all that much supply relative to Northern California, but three and a half percent in Southern California is a little bit below average. Two and a half percent rent growth in the Bay Area is atrocious. Those markets are four percent markets. And so Oakland is, gone under, is going under a renaissance right now, uh, just the amount of product being built there, and that's having ripple effects to San Francisco, San Jose. And so 2.5%, while it may look fairly you know, favorable, especially to some of these red areas, that for that local markets, it's, it's awful. Uh, it's Seattle and Portland up there, tell the two cities. So Seattle, I mean, this is the Amazon story. If anyone's been to South Lake Union, 
up there and walked around. It's an amazing story. Just the energy that you get from Amazon and the Googles and everything, it's just amazing. And the, the number of products that, that have come online there and you know, the demand that's been, been there is just off the charts. And so demand is really the story in uh, Seattle. But the, you juxtapose that with Portland, which Portland enacted an inclusionary zoning policy where you have to build, uh, if you're building a, an apartment project, you have to set aside a certain percentage of units that are affordable. And so that had a deadline and we saw this flurry of permits rush in to the, because they didn't want to be under that. And so we've had this big wave of supply, pretty much pulled four years of, of apartment supply forward. <laughs> Because everyone said we have to get in before we fall under this inclusionary zoning uh, mandate. And so all that supply is hitting, and so that weighs down on uh, uh, Portland. And then looking at the Northeast, those are just slower, slower growing markets. And so if you had an image here, it would kind of be a, a mirror Nike swoosh. So you kind of starts here in the fat part and kind of goes up to here and points that that point is up in Seattle. So that's kind of the visual that I'll uh, have you end with. But it's really high growth markets, southeast Texas, and then those, that inner west is being supported by the great affordability migration from coastal California and then up in uh, Seattle. So that's where I'll end. And, uh, and you can look at my contact information. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out, send me an email, give me a call. More than happy to discuss uh, any other questions that, that you have. But then we'll also have this panel. So. Yeah.